Good morning, everybody. It's so Monday. It's so Monday. I'm glad to see everyone. I hope you're caffeinated because you can bring our Segas in here if you want. This workshop was very, very important to me for multiple reasons. Uh, one, I live on a hill, and so water just runs down into my basement, just nonstop. And two, our summer reading theme is Oceans of Possibilities, so we tried to have as many water-themed workshops as possible. And this isn't the ocean, but I thought it would be very helpful. Fayetteville is so hilly. A lot of us live in older neighborhoods that, you know, if your house was built in 1960, you couldn't foresee that you would have as many neighbors and that more than one of you would have a car and your garage would have to be bigger and somebody might want a pool. And so all these old school problems that we're facing, um, it really does impact stormwater runoff in all of our yards and it's, it's kind of a problem. So we're lucky enough to have Jane Maganot here to talk about it. She is from the County Extension Office at the U of A. She's been there 13 years. Um, she's a stormwater education expert. I have this on high authority. And if any of you were here for the rain barrel workshop recently, Jane led that as well. And before coming to the Extension Service, this really fascinates me. Jane worked in East Africa managing water access projects. So getting people clean water and then helping everyone manage the water systems that they have to live with every day is a, a mega area of her expertise and we're really happy to have her here. Also, Eric Fusiler, Fusiler will be here after a while. He is an environmental scientist and he works at Olson Engineering. So he will be here a little bit later and he'll be the second speaker. And also, um, Jane had some feedback forms on that back table. If you would fill those out for her, that would be wonderful. She would appreciate it. We also have some feedback forms uh, on the back table for just library programming. And we really need that feedback. It helps us a lot. I mean, everything from, you know, could you add this in? Could you have more of these workshops? The room was too hot or too cold. I wish there was more coffee. Anything you want to add. And there's a little uh, a box back there for you to return the forms. So just before you leave, fill out a form and drop them in that box. And I will turn it over to Jane now. Thank you. Um, all right. So again, yeah, my name is Jane Maganot, and I work at the um, Washington County Cooperative Extension Service. Um, I do want to introduce Brad Huffines, who's at the door. He's, he's assisting me um, and helping us out with this workshop. Um, so he, you might see him around. And he's also a, um, extremely knowledgeable on water and water systems, um, so you can catch him at breaks or whatever. Uh, just to go fa a format of today, um, I'll be um, introducing the concepts of stormwater and how it moves um, and some of the base principle ideas of something called low impact development. If you haven't heard that term, that's what we're going to talk about. Um, and uh, then Eric's going to come in and he's going to be, he's my heavy hitter. So I get to like talk about the nice fluffy stuff and he comes in and kind of brings in a lot more of the meat. So I'll get you introduced to the concepts and he'll come in and tell you more of the tangibles of what what to get done. And again, we do have an evaluation at the end, um, so please feel free to, um, to fill that out. And there will be a short break between Eric and I to give everybody a chance to get up and stretch their legs or ask a few questions. I know at a lot of workshops like this, people tend to want to really like on my property, on my property, on my property. We definitely encourage you to asking questions, but think about if it's a question that's going to be for the larger audience or if it's something specific to your property, uh, try to catch one of us individually or um, email us. Um, so uh, Eric works really closely with a group called uh, Wild Ones um, in the Ozark chapters. They also do site visits um, as well as we can come out and do site visits um, in accordance if it's, it's available. But I'm going to give you, hopefully give you guys some tools where you guys will have the knowledge yourself um, to go through some of the, the eyes and the ears of stormwater. So again, my name is Jane Mag and I work at the County Extension Office. Who here has heard of the Washington County Extension Office? Yay, I, this is such a great idea. <laughs> I thought we'd have some. So most people, when I ask that question, they're like, what is Extension? So we are the education outreach um, branch of the University of Arkansas. Every state in the United States has an Extension service. Every county in Arkansas has an office. Um, not all states have kept county offices. Arkansas has. Um, and we mostly work with farming, agricultural, natural resource management. We do have a youth outreach with the 4-H program. 
Um, a lot of people know about the Master Gardener program or our home economist clubs or some of our bigger, bigger groups. Um, we do things like free soil testing. If you want to find out if, what the nutrient needs of your soils are, we do that for free. Uh, if your plant's sick, bring it in. We can tell you what the problem is. If you have a bug in your house and you don't know what it is and you want to know how to get rid of it, you bring it to us. We tell you what it is. So that's what we do. All of our services are free, um, and we are to get education out there. So always reach out to us um, if you need anything. All right, so we're going to move into stormwater here. What happens when it rains? So on a natural ground cover, when it rains, about half of the water is going to soak into the ground. A little less than half goes up into the air through evaporation. If you guys remember back to fourth grade science, there's a water cycle. It moves around. So about a half of it goes up into evaporation. And about 10% runs off. So runoff. That's any rain, snow melt that moves across our surface. So it becomes water that's moving across the top of our land. That's natural with no development. That's what natural looks like. So it's mostly green areas with a few little houses. Um, but that's natural. About half the water is going to soak in if it rains in an area like this. But as we start to develop and we start to build out, which means we're creating hard surfaces over the ground, which does not allow for water to absorb anymore, we're going to start generating more and more runoff. So this area right here, there's a lot of green space. This has been planned and developed to maintain green space. There's trees, there's grassy areas. But if we look at all the areas that can't soak up water, the impervious surface areas, what does that look like here? All the roads, the parking lots, the sidewalks, the building tops. We get into about a 50, or a, that's about a 50% build out in this area. So only about half of the area here can soak up water anymore. So what does that mean for stormwater? Well, and now at a 50 to set, or 75 to 100% build out, when it rains, water is going to hit that hard surface and it's going to start moving. It can't soak in anymore. Um, and it has opportunities for flooding. Um, so what used to be 50% is now down to 15% of so soaking into our ground and recharging our groundwaters. We still have a lot of evaporation. Those parking lots make a lot of parking lot puddles. There's still a lot of urban treescapes that we use. So that's going to evaporate up into the, um, into the air. And about 55% now is runoff. So it was a 10% is now 55%. So we have a larger volume of water moving across the surface. So let's look at Fayetteville, since this is where we are. So this would be 49, and this is MLK. The library is over here. That's a lot of impervious surface. Check out some of those parking lots. So those are some big concrete scapes that are not soaking in water anymore. Uh, this is the city of Fayetteville in 1986. Let's see how it changes. So this is just mostly on the west side of town, even looking. Yeah. And this was 2020 is the most updated we have. Oh, that? And again, that's a fun one. All right, here we go. So as we start to move, we're building and developing more and more hard scapes. Um, stormwater regulations in Fayetteville did not start until 1993. So before that, there wasn't much consideration as to what happens to the water when we build. Um, but now there are permits and drainage permits and manuals that are put in place to help mitigate some of that water flow. But before that, it was fairly unregulated. Um, so how much rainfall are we talking about? So here we are, this is the United States. This is Arkansas. In Northwest Arkansas, we get about 45 to 48 inches of rain a year. So Arkansas is the eighth wettest state in the United States. There are the, think of the heavy hitters, Hawaii is the outlier, it's the wettest. So that's fine, he gets to that one, but it doesn't count really. <laughs> but the two through seven is all the south central part of the United States, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, um, the, a lot of our deep south southern farming states. Those are our heavy rain states. Um, when you move over to the western part of the United States, this area right through here, there are spots in Colorado and in the desert areas that get less than three inches of water a year. So we're at 46 to 48. 
There are areas that get almost none. I mean, we can't even imagine how water rich we are sometimes and lucky we are to have so much rainfall. May not feel like it this week, and I think it's gonna stay the same next week. But, um, so we have a lot of water moving. So where is that water going? How are we structured our urban environment to get that water away from our homes and our streets for health and human safety? So think about that 45 inches of rain. If it were to come down on this, all these hardscapes, that water would flood out our houses. So we've put in these storm drain infrastructure. So there's an inlet and there is its outfall. So an inlet is where the water falls in, goes into, and an outfall is where it comes out to a creek or a stream. So every storm drain inlet in Northwest Arkansas is tied directly to a creek or stream. It might have a bioswell or some kind of infrastructure in between to try to help um, clean some of that water, which we'll go into depth about in a little bit. But for the most part, it's gonna go straight into a creek or stream. The only cleaning happening right here is that filter grate. Um, which has, you can see, has caught some of the trash that's come off of our streets. Um, these are actually, while they, they're great in collecting some of those floatables, they don't collect any of our, our pollutants that might be in the water. And they're also a health and human safety concern because if for some reason there are some larger outfall or um, inlets out there, though think about those big culverts, um, is if a child got stuck in there. So that's, these are really, um, kind of an old school way of doing them. They're, they're becoming more open, which doesn't catch the floatables anymore, but that is one way. So, um, so we have water that flows at that, now that 55% runoff is coming off of a roof, through a downspout, down a driveway, over a sidewalk, down a street, and all of that's being concentrated into this, this area. Our pipes are completely separate. So it's a muni municipal separate storm sewer system. So our sanitary sewer pipes that flush from your uh, toilets, from your kitchen sinks, from your washing machines, that goes to the wastewater treatment plant and that gets cleaned um, and then released back out into a creek. This does not, anything that's on our streets is gonna go right into a creek. Um, and you ask, well, why? Like, why is that? Well, there are cities out there that have combined sewer systems. Um, and so the stormwater from the street as well as the water from their homes, all go to a wastewater treatment plant, which sounds really awesome, right? Because then all that water is getting cleaned. But we have 45 inches of rain every year. Think of the size of a wastewater treatment plant we would need to be able to collect all that water and clean it. And then what happens when we get a seven inch rain, which seems to be almost common now, um, that water hits that wastewater treatment plant and that infrastructure, and it can backflow up, creating sewage onto our streets. So older cities, New York City, parts of St. Louis, Chicago, um, those older built cities have combined sewer systems um, and it creates really bad health and human safety concerns at a major flood because that water backs up and then you have uh, sanitary sewage on your city streets. So that's why we, one of the reasons we went to this combined sewer system. I know I'm giving you a lot of backstory here, but I feel that it's really important to understand um, the why behind we do, we do some of these things. So it's not combined, it's separate. Ours is completely, all in Arkansas. There are no combined systems in, in Arkansas. So ours is all new. All right, so where does the water go? So it goes into a creek or stream. And so these are our watersheds. Have you guys heard the term watershed before? Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. So this is all the Beaver Lake watershed here. And then this is Illinois, the green. Um, Bentonville's kind of, this is Bentonville right here. It's split in half. Half of it goes up to Elk River. Half of it goes into Illinois. Uchi Spavanal, I know it's, Uchi, it's pronounced that way. <laughs> Uchi Spavanal goes over to Oklahoma. Um, Fayetteville is split right down the middle. Um, and Springdale is almost all Illinois. Rogers is almost all Illinois. Um, even there are parts of Springdale you can almost see Beaver Lake, but you're actually still in the Illinois River uh, watershed because the way that our topography is. So you have, um, Think about uh, going up down College Avenue, uh, Sycamore, those big high crested streets. That's what splits our watersheds. So why is it bad? Well, we know you guys probably are here because you know the flooding aspects of it. But there's also all the pollutants in there. So the floatables we talked about, litter, bacteria, so pet waste. The city of Fayetteville produces about six million pounds of dog poop every single year. Um, and so that is based off an average size dog, off the average amount of waste that's produced. We last did a survey, it was 2002, 
At that time, 30% of people in the city of Fayetteville picked up their, or 30% of the people of Northwest Arkansas picked up their pet waste. I really hope that number has increased dramatically since then. We would love to do a new updated survey um, to find out how, many, um, how much dog poop's getting collected. Because if not, that is a large amount of bacteria and nutrients that goes into our waterways. Um, now in your backyard, not as much, a lot of it's gonna get absorbed into your backyard. But think of our trail systems. Um, I, when we had some flooding, I think it was 2017, Sycamore Street Apartments at Leverett um, flooded and that, from, that from the creek, from Skull Creek, and it was like a little dog bomb like parking lot out there. It was just everywhere. So, because um, that trail was getting used a lot so much. So again, I really, even since 2017, I'm hoping that people are being more active and proactive in picking up pet waste um, and disposing of it properly. So bacteria. Um, and uh, Clear Creek actually is an impaired stream for bacteria. So the EPA has said that Clear Creek, which runs out of Lake Fayetteville and flows over the north part of um, Fayetteville, uh, down kind of south of Tiny Town, and flows into the Illinois River, that creek is an impaired water body for bacteria. The EPA says it's likely if you go swimming and submerge your head in that, you could become sick. So they, they say that they should not swim in there. It has lost a designated use, which is what's made it impaired. Is that the creek that goes, uh, that 112 goes across? Mm -hmm. That's the one. Yep, yeah, so you, it's fine for wading. They say it's fine for recreation for wading, but not for swimming. You should not submerge your head. Um, and there are three impaired water bodies in uh, Fayetteville. So, well, two that are official. One is Clear Creek, um, and the other is the West Fork of the White River for sediment. It's too turbid, it has too much cloud, uh, too much soil in there, which we're gonna talk about. And then the third is, um, is proposed, and I don't know if it's been approved yet, but it's gonna be Town Branch, which flows in the southern part of Fayetteville that flows into the West Fork, and that one's also for sediment. Um, so that one's, that one's under review right now. Um, all right, so uh, pesticides. So think of all the lawns that are happening out there. They're using pesticides um, or yard chemicals um, especially weed, weed and feeds, um, in, in an inappropriate manner. They're not using it the way they should be using it. So those are hitting our, our creeks and streams. Automobile fluids, oh, so automobile fluids. There are 210,000 registered vehicles in Washington County. So if 1% of those had an oil leak, if you guys have ever seen a parking lot after a rain and that rainbow sheen, yeah, that's all refined oil hitting our, our creeks and streams every time it rains. It's especially when we haven't had rain for a long time, and we have that first rain, we call it a first flush. When stormwater hits that, it is, it's really refreshing and everything looks nice and clean, but all of that's gonna end up right into a creek or stream. All right, so I'm gonna concentrate on two here uh, for the rest of this, which is nutrients and sediment. This is what happens when we have erosion leaving your house. So we have sediment hitting our, which is soil that gets suspended in water, and then nutrients. Um, so let's start with nutrients and think about where it comes from. It comes from over fertilizing or improperly fertilizing, which is why we get free soil test at the extension office. We want you to use, the, we want you to have well nourished lawns. It's fine to use fertilizers when you know what you're doing. And so a lot of people just go to the local home improvement store, buy their bags and put it out on their lawns, not knowing what they need. We're in a phosphorus rich neighborhood. We usually do not need phosphorus in our lawns. Um, and we've worked really <laughs> encouraged strongly our local uh, home improvement stores to carry phosphorus-free fertilizers, and they do now. Um, and so what you do is you come to the office, bring your soil test. We tell you exactly how much is needed. We work a lot with landscape companies um, who are doing whole neighborhoods because that's really a big impact um, if it's not being fertilized. So if, it, if, it's, if your yard's over-fertilized, that water can become, when it rains, those fertilizers become water soluble and then get leached out and flow into a creek or stream. Um, we talked about pet waste, so there's nutrients, just like you hear of manures being used in farming. Those nutrients are in all waste, so pet waste. This is grass clippings. Um, grass clippings and leaves do not belong down storm drains. They actually cause fish kills um, at the outfall because when they hit those outfalls, they start to decompose and it sucks the oxygen out of the water. Um, it's also a really bad hazard for anybody who rides motorcycles. If you've ever hit a fresh pile of grass clippings, it's like riding on ice. Um, over fertilization again, that's a, those are granule fertilizers. And then soil itself, when we see erosion happen, not only is it dropping sediment, 
and making our waters muddy, it's actually our soils have nutrients. We talked about them being for, uh, phosphorus rich. Those, those nutrients that are in our soil then become um, released in the water when our soil is eroding. So what does it happen to our water? So there's, I'm gonna go, I, like I really like the science of water. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try not to bore you guys too much here, but um, I, I am a novice. I am not a water scientist by any means. My graduate degree is in international peace and conflict resolution. I don't wanna put out any pretense here that I'm a water scientist, <laughs> but I have really studied a lot. <laughs> I play one on TV for sure. So um, when it rains, um, all that fertilizer and runoff go into our creeks and our streams, and it feeds some of the plants that are there, one of those being an algae plant, which is a, a naturally occurring plant, but when it, starts when it gets too much fertilizer, it grows at an unnatural rate, and you get algae blooms. You guys have heard that term before. And so when they start to decompose, they suck the oxygen out of the water, they're the the mass of the plants themselves dies off to the bottom. It fills up the bottom of the, the lake. It sucks the oxygen out and it gets this hydroponic, or hydroponic, hydro, what word am I going for? Hi, no, hypoxic, that's it. I was like, I, was like, I know that term. So the water um, becomes void of oxygen and then um, the sunlight can't get in there to, to help the plants grow that need to be in there because you have that algae scum on top of the water. There's a lot of times I hear people call it that scum. Um, and it smells really bad too. Um, and it also increased the cost of treatment if you, for, waste, or for, for drinking water. As you guys know, Beaver Lake is our drinking water supply. So a lot of our water from our urban areas are flowing up there. Um, and it's gonna increase the cost um, to get that cleaned. And um, eutrophication is a, it's a natural process. This has been happening, it should be happening. It's part of our, our systems, but it's, it's accelerating. Um, as those nutrients are hitting our waterways, we're seeing lakes fill quickly um, and needing action a lot faster than what would happen in a natural setting. Um, yeah, so dissolved oxygen, low fish populations, odor problems, um, it's, it's pretty, pretty gross and we see it happening very much so here in Northwest Arkansas. This is sediment in waterways. So this is what sediment, where it comes from is when it hits. So we think about the, we talked about the volume of that 55%. Think about the velocity that that water is moving at now. So we're getting it off from our streets and our uh, driveways as fast as we can so we can get ambulances down the street during a flood event so people can drive home safely. And all that water is hitting that storm drain system really fast and then it gets shot out into a creek or stream very quickly to keep the upland from flooding. Um, but this is what's happening to our creeks and streams downstream is it's hitting those soil banks and creating these cut banks right there. This, is, this one's actually been remediated. This is Gully Park. This was before they did the um, stream restoration there. And this is what it looks like. So if you guys have seen your yards and you see those little reels that's what those are called. So that's, that's erosion leaving your property and getting into the creek. And this is just a little rain event here. Um, and you can see in this neighborhood, this home right here is having clear water leaving it and this home is having erosion issues going into the same creek. So it's, it was a pretty contrasted spot there. Okay, you guys made it through. So that's, this is, that was the more you know, that's the stormwater education lesson. That's the why, that's the meat of what we're doing. So what can we do about it? How can we change? Um, how can we change development? We're not gonna answer those questions in here because that's more back into our civil engineering friends and our planning friends. Um, you do have access to your city council members though. Um, uh, how many people here are the city of Fayetteville? Okay, so a good chunk. Um, there is a proposed stormwater utility fee that's coming up. Um, they don't know if it's gonna go through council or not. Um, they're still waiting on that. It's, it's gonna go through council. The council has the choice to either adopt it as is or they have the right to put it out to the voters. So that probably in the next five years, you will probably hear something coming down the pipe from that. It's been, happy, it's, it's been in the works for a very long time. And the idea is that they're gonna put in a utility fee that will pay for some of the infrastructure and drainage problems that we're having in the city of Fayetteville. Um, there is no other city in Northwest Arkansas that currently has that. There's some other cities looking at it um, in the, across the state of Arkansas, the city of Hot Springs and the city of Bryant are the only two that have that in place. 
So anyway, I'm not going to go. We're not going to go into to how the city designed. We know what was done. We know the mistakes that have been made. So how do we move forward? And what are we can we do about what we're responsible for? So the runoff from our homes. Um, so there's a term, low impact development. How many people have heard that term? Low impact development. Okay, good. All right. So we want to. Low impact development is a way to take a runoff, to slow it down, to spread it out, and to soak it in. So we're going to call it LID after this, LID, low impact development. How do we get water to slow down on your property, to soak in your property, to get, recharge that groundwater um, that is no longer getting recharged, and how to spread it out? All right, so here's just a few. This is from the uh, U of A Community Design Center. They came out with a book called LID a few years ago. Um, and so just to give you the principles of how it works. So we're going to slow down that water. So we're going to put in, you know, curb guts. You have the right to put in cub, curb guts. I said that backwards. Curb guts in Fayetteville. Um, you'll uh, need permission from um, city uh, officials or whatever. This is typically trying to get it off of a street or off of a driveway and get it back into a lawn. Um, so if you have a sloped driveway that is curbed, because originally we always were get rid of it, get rid of our rainfall, get rid of the rainfall, get rid of it, get it off my property. And so they'd actually put in little bumpers. A lot of times you'll see them on the sides of driveways, um, especially in steep areas, to keep it from going into our homes. Um, but what that does now is that it's, it's impacting your neighbor downstream even more because they're getting all of yours. Um, but this is a way you could put little curb guts in there to get the water to slow down. Um, what was that name? Curb, curb cut. I think I said that five different ways, but <laughs> my tongue tie, but curb cut. Um, and you're cutting the curb. So you've, you've literally cut a hole in your curb. Yes? So in, in my, uh, on the curb at my, in front of my house, there's someone, I'm assuming it was the city, came in with a concrete saw and cut a slit in mm -hmm. the curb. Is that a curb cut? It probably is what they're intending it to be, yes whether it was designed properly or not. And that was post-construction, I'm assuming. That was like, you've been living in that house for a long time and they well, put that in. <laughs> yeah, so they were, there's a chance that perhaps there was some downstream flooding that they were trying to mitigate. Well, it was my problem. Okay, okay. <laughs> so. You know what I'll do is actually, I did put it in here, but at the end, um, I think I might have internet access. I'll show you where to put in those complaints. I'm assuming you've talked to the city. No? Okay. I'll show you guys how to make an official complaint with the city as well. I'll use Fayetteville as an example. If I can get access to internet. If not, I'll walk you through it. Um, and um, I am, my talk's going to be a lot about the stormwater that you mitigate. I've asked Eric to speak about how to deal with stormwater you're taking on. Um, and so he's really going to hit a lot of those questions, hopefully, um, when he gets here. Because he, again, he's as a, more of a, from the engineering side of things, because especially on areas that are steep sloped, you're getting a lot of water coming in, and we really want to make sure your foundation's taken care of and your home and property are taken care of. Um, and so we'll, we'll get to that. Um, and so mechanical, this is um, actually a detention pond. So this is something that has been put in, and these are dry, Holds. You see them a lot with like when they put in a Sam's Club or any building, they'll put in a building and then they create this area. The water flows into this holding area and then it slowly lets it out. So we've stopped that, that, that velocity. And then there's retention, which is more like a ponding area where you've created a pond that holds water and is made to hold water for a long period of time. So those are two terms. I, these are just kind of get you to introducing to the terms that we're going to use about when we talk about more of the things you can do at your home. Um, and so this is filtration. Um, so that's a, that's a grass paver. So it's a driveways um, with paver systems underneath that lets the water soak in. Um, filtration is a way of treating that water to get out some of those sediments and the nutrients. Um, grass pavers are great because they can take in those nutrients um, that might be... Um, heavier in our runoff. Biological um, controls of that infiltration. So this is a, a rain garden. Have you guys heard the term rain garden? Yes. All right, so we're going to talk about those a little bit. Um, and that is a uh, semi-wet, so it, it 
gets wet during a rain, and it's made to slowly percolate that water down into the ground, and you are infiltrating that water at this point. So it's not just passing through those plants like a buffer, but it's infiltrating the water into the ground. And then there's treatment. And these are plants that we use to actually treat the water. So our plants are great at something called phytoremediation, and they can take in that water, take out the pollutants, and then let that, our plants actually release water through evapotranspiration, and so they're letting out clean water. So that's the way that we can treat. All right, so the first step in looking at your home and property is an umbrella survey. So go out in a rain event, not post rain event, not after it rains, but during the rain event. You might be surprised where you think the water's flowing um, and where it actually is coming from and where it's going to. So during a rain event, go out, take some pictures, look at it, take note of the speed of that water that's coming in. Try to get an idea for the volume of that water. So you might go out in a light rain event versus a heavy rain event. Get to know your stormwater. Know where it's flowing from, where it's going to. And then we're going to ask you to create a site map. It doesn't have to be this fancy. It can just be a little sketch drawing. So draw it out. Where is the water coming from? Where is it going to? And how are you impacting it? Where are your rooftops? Where are dog runs that might be in compacted soils? Um, where are, if you have a compost pile, is it near a stream or a drainage area? Um, do you have vegetable gardens? What area is, is, is there an external drain? So if you're on near a street, is there an inlet nearby? Is there a drainage easement or right of way through, um, through your um, property? Look for those things. Um, know where your creeks are. Know, know what's around you. Know the water. Get to know it. So how much water is coming off your roof and off of your land? So again, this isn't your run on. This isn't what you're taking. This is what you're generating. So what you're taking in, so determine your roof print. This is a bird's eye view. You're looking down at your property. Don't think about your sloped roof. Think about looking down as, as a two-dimensional. We're going to take your property, turn it 2D, and look down on like a Google Earth map. Um, and you're going to multiply all your impervious surfaces with your length time your width. This doesn't have to be exact, and you don't have to do it. To me, it's kind of interesting to know what your runoff calculation is. So an example, if, you're, if your roof print is 25 feet one way and 40 feet this way, you're just going to multiply your length time your width. And so you have 1,000 square feet of hard surface. But don't forget to do your driveway, your sidewalk, uh, if you have patios, concreted areas, and again, soil that acts like concrete. So dog runs, places that are compacted, even if you're driving on it, it's a driveway. <laughs> We have a lot of clay soils here. It doesn't take much to compact it and basically create concrete. People are like, oh, my, my gravel driveway is impervious. I'm like, how long have you been driving on that gravel driveway? It probably does not soak up a lot of water. So, um, so that think of add, add all those up. It um, doesn't have to be exact. You can even count it off with your feet um, just to give you an idea. So what you're going to do now is you're going to take that square footage and you're going to multiply it by 0.623. That says that every one inch rainfall is going to generate 623 feet of 623 gallons of water. So if I have 975 square foot of impervious surface multiplied by 0 0.623 and I have 607 gallons of water after every one inch rain. So if it's a seven inch rain, you'll then take that number and multiply it by seven. I really don't like working with seven inch rains. <laughs> I would like to go back to two inch rains, but I don't think that's the way we're going. Um, all right, so and 975 is not very much square foot surface. I would bet most of your homes are larger than that. Um, and so as we get to a 3,000 square foot, which is a little bit more typical, um, because again, we're not looking at you know, your floor space. We're looking, we don't care how many floors you have or how sloped your roof is or how pitched it is. It's really just that bird's eye view down. So um, 1,800 gallons of water off a of one inch rain. So it's a lot of water. 
um, assuming we have a 45 inch annual rainfall and a 1200 square foot home, that's 28,000 gallons of water every year off your one home. So think about your neighborhood, look around you. Here are some simple solutions and some not so simple solutions we're gonna go into. I'm gonna orient you, all of my slides will have these three indicators. One, is it inexpensive or very expensive? Is it a do-it-yourself project or is it a professionally done project? Um, and then how much volume of it is are we actually gonna be able to mitigate on this using this technique? This is called redirecting your downspouts. Super simple concept. Take your downspout and move it someplace else. It probably is directed to your driveway right now um, or into a compacted area on your lawn or it's going into a big washout goalie spot. Move it someplace to like a landscaped uh, uh, bed out to a nice soft grass area or if you, can't, if you don't have those options, put in something that's gonna slow it down when it hits out of that downspout. So it's rushing out of there, emptying probably a quarter of your roof area, coming down that downspout, slow it down somehow. There are some really fancy ones you could do. You could put little water features in there. Um, but those, that's very simple. We all have a lot of rocks around here. Um, and slow it down. There's even just a simple splash guard you can buy at a home improvement store that's like $1.50. You just tack it right at the bottom, and the idea is that it's just not going to erode that splash gully spot as it comes out of your downspout. Very inexpensive, very much do it yourself. You can also get rid of your gutters altogether and just have it that sheet flow coming off of your roof. But that determines, you know, you want to live and enjoy your landscape too, um, which might not be where you want it to go. Rain chains, inexpensive, do it yourself. Not much volume being, but it is, they're, they're gorgeous and people like them and it's something you can do. So it's raining, the water's coming off your downspout. You've now removed your entire downspout and put in an obstacle for that water to meander through. So they typically have a cupped up cup movement in there. So the water is hitting it, coming up, hitting it, coming up, hitting it, coming up, hitting it, coming up. And then it has a bowl trapment at the bottom which is slowing it down and not creating a washout. It is very important to make sure it is downsloped from your home and your home is properly graded because you do not want to flood your house out. Um, if, uh, so this one's on a rise, so that's very easily done there, but um, this one has a big, uh, I think this one actually has a rain barrel it's flowing into. Um, these you can buy online. I've heard Tractor Supply has them now. Um, but again, you're not really cutting down your volume here. You know, it's not, you're not solving any drainage issues, but it looks nice. And you did something. Rain barrels. So we mentioned rain barrels. Um, these are 55 gallon drums. Typically, they range in sizes, but that standard is about 55 to 75 gallons. You can buy them um, from stores or online. You can make them yourself. Uh, there was a rain barrel handout fact sheet. We ran out of those. Um, I'll show you where you can get more. But these are inexpensive ways to gather 55 gallons of water for you to then to slowly disperse. 28,000 gallons of water is coming off of your roof. On a one inch rain, um, 623 gallons on a thousand square foot. This is 55 gallons. So again, our volume is pretty low, but make sure it has an overflow. So there's a little hose there and it flows off into these little grassed areas. You're at least slowing it down. It's a drop in the bucket in almost a very literal sense of a way. But you can chain them up. This guy's got it worked out, or gal has it worked out where they've chained them all together. You're increasing your head pressure. You're getting more water. You're catching more water. So there's a way to do that. There's also those 275 gallon tanks you can now find on Facebook Marketplace. Just make sure they're food grade because you don't know what's going to be inside those. Um, but those, you might see them, they're 275 gallon white tanks with aluminum framing around it. Um, same concepts. Rain barrel on steroids. Cisterns. Um, this is lacked. So we have this. It's getting a little bit more expensive. They can be very expensive, especially if you hook up gray water to them. Um, but then you've got your home in a closed system where you can use gray water to um, do things such as flush your toilet. You don't have to use treated water. We don't. We're very rich in an area that we can use treated, cleaned water to flush our feces down. <laughs> That's pretty pretty elaborate. So you can use gray water for that. Um, or they can be a below ground, so all you see this little black cap. And so all these gutters are guttered right into there, catching all of their roof and their, um, 
impervious surface is going in there. Um, there's an elaborate little pump system in there going back into their gray water. You can see they have a little sink as well as a washer and dryer. Um, not drinking water. This isn't for drinking water. This is just be for gray water. Um, but <coughs> everything else would still be covered in that. Um, and then um, below ground is all there. Or you can do above ground. One gallon of water weighs eight pounds. So if you have a 3,000 gallon cistern, you need to make sure that that has uh, been put in in a stable area that can hold that weight. Um, it needs to have some kind of surface. Um, you're not gonna just put a cinder block underneath it and hold that up. Um, you need to make sure it's level um, and it's not gonna tip over. Um, and so that's where I get into the, it's not quite something you can do yourself if you, unless you happen to have expertise. Um, but you can put that in. Um, and also just for irrigation, you can put little pumps on those and uh, irrigate all your landscaping with that. Um, uh, Eco Modern Flats in Fayetteville, right around the UVA, they have that. They have above ground cisterns uh, off their rooftops that they use to land, uh, water their landscape. So this is getting more into the heavy hitters. Dry wells and French drains. You guys have probably heard of French drains. They're good. They've been used a lot. They're kind of the tried and true way of getting drainage issues solved. Um, it's a perforated pipe with uh, pea gravel around it. Um, in a trenched drain, usually then copped right back over so it doesn't impact your landscaping, you've got a grassy area. You're really just moving water from one spot to the next spot here. There is some infiltration possibly happening if done, installed correctly, but eventually that's probably gonna get clogged. Um, but that's the idea, is you're moving the way, you're getting rid of your drainage problem and probably putting it out into the street. Um, which again, that's what you got to do. <laughs> it's allowed, but you might be creating a problem downstream from you. These are dry wells. Have you guys heard of these? So their dry well is a, it's a French drain, but instead of it being horizontal, it's vertical almost. So you're really trying to get it to soak in that one spot. It's it takes a large amount of digging. If you have the capacity to do that, if not, this is where it gets into the. You're going to move into a professional, even have them come dig the hole. These are either, I've seen them with 35 or 55 gallon trash uh, drums. It's not going to hold a lot of water. They make, cities do these on very large scales. Um, and so you're not going to be using a, you know, 4,000 gallon drain, but it could be something that is, um, you can buy online and, and have brought in or order from a home improvement store. Um, and these are perforated, so they're holes. This is, this is, so you have a big hole, you have, again, usually there's a liner, a sediment liner. This one, I think, almost looks like a tarp. It should be just a filter fabric that is keeping the sediment from washing back into that gravel to keep it pervious. Um, treating the soil around it, uh, amending it to make sure it's, it can permeate to get it started. Pea gravel it in, put that trash can there with all the holes, and let the water go. It's piped from your, this one's going from a downspout underneath your lawn so you wouldn't see it. And then again, you have a little inlet there for cleaning and checking the water at the top that you'll see. So it looks like usually like a little slit drain on the top part. But then there's this whole storage area there that takes the water and then lets it slowly filter back into the ground. So back to our infiltration, our volume, depending on the size of your dry well, it could be quite large. Um, downfall is that, you know, if this gets clogged, you're gonna have to unclog it and fix it. It needs to be installed properly. Um, and then also is that if it gets filled, make sure you have a backflow overflow. You need it somehow or other that gets filled and it's coming. Again, our rains are starting to become extremely heavy more frequently. So you need to have a way, if we're getting one of those seven inch rains, a way for that water to escape. Yes? How does the water unclog it? Uh, right, exactly. So you'd have to dig it out and clean it. Dig it after the closet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, which if installed properly, should never clog. But was it installed properly? I don't ever trust people. <laughs> How do you know if it's clogged? That when it rains, it falls right back out. It's the water, the water that, that's a little check spot right there, so you can pull that off and look at how water, say you had a rain event, you go back and look 48 hours later and that barrel is still full, it's clogged. Are you take the chalk off? Yeah, there's a little, that's an inspection point. It's above ground. So it's like a little, you can mow over it usually. They're like usually surface level. Um, it's open and look in there. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. It could be, yeah. You'd probably look like a fountain. <laughs> um, it depends on how it's uh, how it's put in. If it's down, if it's down slope from your home, yes, that would work as an overflow. If it was any type of upslope, it wouldn't. It would come back at that pipe. So, 
Rain gardens, love them. So these are a way to catch the, tree, or the runoff from your homes, down your downspout, across your lawn. You don't want it right next to your house because um, it can cause uh, foundation issues. You're collecting water and letting it soak in, so you want to bring it away from your house a little bit. Putting in native plants to help those roots soak up water. And again, we talked a little bit about phytoremediation and those treats, um, those plants being able to treat some of the, the contaminants coming off of your roof. So if you have a shingled roof, there is uh, heavy metals coming off of your roof as well. So um, those plants can help in that. Um, this is not just digging a hole in the ground and putting plants in. It is a process. Um, there are lots of resources online on how to build rain gardens. Um, take a look at it. If you still have questions, we have a, a website of our, um, a page on our website that's dedicated to rain gardens and more resources. Um, so I'm not going to go into that in very much detail, but it is a, you dig it out, you amend the soil to make a bowl shape so it is depressed, and then you fill it back in with gym material that can percolate that in. <coughs> Diversion berms. This one's actually very easy, very inexpensive, and creates a ton of water capture. Um, so this is what we call a keyhole berm. This is uh, from a company called Terra Firma out of uh, Massachusetts. No, sorry, Maine. And um, they, uh, he's a, actually an old extension agent um, that has retired and created a permaculture business uh, for stormwater from urban areas. And I love his stuff. So this is a keyhole drain. So that's a gutter. That's the splash guard I mentioned. This is a dug out by two foot. All these little circles have been dug out two feet. Um, to let that water hit that, it's going to fill that hole, flow over, fill that hole, flow over, fill that hole, flow over, fill that hole, flow over. And then these are landscaped with native plants. So this is a brand new planting, but now this is probably several years old. It probably looks very kind of bushy, um, but those roots are keeping all that soil in place and not letting that water flow over. So, um, yes? Is that down? Keep down? Yes, exactly, right. Right, so this is just from the, his already uh, sloped, probably large yard from his home. It was, and then this is the same from a different angle. So you can see that hidden that hole. You just can't see it as much. And there's the plantings there. And then this is the same concept, but they're little deburn, little burns. So this is a, a parking area or off of a street. And then it's what's happening is you're just creating little dams of vegetated swells to keep that water in place. I often recommend using sometimes sandbags before you do all the heavy lifting of work. Keep them in your bags, just to put them in there to see the size that you need. And then you can move them around later. It's like, so if, like, I wonder if a berm would work here. I don't know. We'll put out some, go buy a few sandbags or make, you know, fill some sandbags, put them out there, and then watch that water go after a couple of rain events and see if the size of your berm was able to slow down that water. Um, these should be, now that they're vegetated, they should be taking in a lot of that water and not just moving it to the sides. Are but these, um, lined with anything? They're not lined, but they are amended soils. So it's you, you dig out our, our native clays and you add things like compost or sand or um, types of you know, topsoil that it's a little bit better to, to be able to percolate that soil in, that rain or that water in. All right. Hügelkultur. Who here speaks German? All right, nobody. Okay, good. So I can pronounce it however I want. Um, so this is a, I am so excited Extension. So Extension is a fact-based, research-based organization. We're not going to come at you with something we haven't done the research on because we don't know. But with uh, OSU, so Oklahoma State University, which does have a permaculture and low-impact development center as part of their Extension, not that I'm jealous, but they do. Um, they have this. They have come out with a new fact sheet called Hugel Culture, <laughs> and it's taken this old, you know, adage of taking uh, decaying logs and creating these berms. So they have they have done a fact sheet on Hugel Culture and turned it into a stormwater mitigation tool. So these berms. So this is their house. This is a sloped area. So they've kind of created these Hugel terraces to maximize the amount of water they're infiltrating in there. So they have, this, is, this has not been landscaped yet, or not planted yet, but it has been landscaped. So they've got these dead logs through here, covered with soil, compost, twigs. It's, you know, it's a little process. You can Google this and find. Um, <laughs> Google the Google. <laughs> and, 
and then uh, it'll show you how to do that. And again, this was a design from uh, Terra Firma, my uh, friend up in Maine. And that gravel helps, again, it helps create places for that to, to absorb. I'm putting this back into it. It's a pretty expensive, and you might want to bring in somebody with some more technical knowledge, especially if you're terracing large land slopes. But you could probably mitigate a lot of water coming off with things like that. Oh, and then also as to make sure, um, he, when I asked if there was any issues, they said, you know, some people have been putting these um, with the slope of their land. You actually want to put it contour slope. I mean, the idea is you're catching the water as it goes. You don't want it to just ride side by side with the water. So as you can see from a, from a side, you're just looking at one little hump there. Think of like a rain garden. So these are two different ways. You can do them, kind of dig them down a little bit to look, kind of get them set more, or you can lay them on top. I think especially those with a lot of fast erosion, it probably is wise to, to settle them in a little bit. And then eventually over time, these, de these, these decompose, and you create it kind of a permanent ridge line in your landscaping. Um, and uh, it's like a rain garden. It works the same way as a rain garden, but instead of it being a depressed bowl to hold that water, you're creating these berms um, that are contoured to our slope. Yes? And so that, the tops of those berms gets planted, but the, it, there's, there's not much concern about the wood itself, like depleting nitrogen from the soil? There is, yes. <laughs> so that is right. Yeah, it has an issue. So as that starts to decompose, it will deplete nitrogen from your, um, from your plants. So you actually are going to look for things that aren't going to take a lot of heavy feeding. Again, natives tend to be what would be planted in here because they don't require a lot of heavy feeding. Am I making lots of noise? I don't know. <laughs> All right, so dry creek beds. Um, and these are, you, you guys on Mount Sequoia have seen these in use. This is probably the most used uh, water mitigation because, again, you're getting a lot of run on from your neighbors and you're trying to get it to pass through. But this is a creek that is not made to hold water but to let water pass in a design channel through your property. Um, with the added goal of trying to percolate at least a sum of, some of it. Um, a lot of it on steep slopes, it's just as I think an intangible goal because you need that water to move, it's not gonna flood. So much so that many of the ones that you'll see on Mount Sequoia are actually under pipe, they'll have an under drain going through them. So it's basically like an exposed French drain. Um, again, it's a tool and it's one commonly used and it can be gorgeous in landscaping. It can be the feature of your landscaping. Um, so instead of taking that water and making it an eyesore, you've created a beautiful landscape around it. Um, volume, it completely depends on how much you're able to infiltrate. And that's, you know, if you're using your landscape fabric versus a um, filter fabric, um, you want the water to soak down as much as possible, but the more you want it to soak down, that means the more amending you have to do with the installation part. And how do you keep leaves out of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why a lot of people go down to putting that landscape fabric down, which then you're not capturing any water anyway. But yeah, the seeds. Yeah. The top mm -hmm. I see a lot of people end up using Roundup. <laughs> that's what I see. <laughs> they, they spray them all down. Because if not, you're out there, you're hand weeding. Oh, yeah. So, goats. <laughs> goats, stay in the channel. Stay in the channel. Um, With the wooded hillside? Mm hmm. No, this would be definitely be lawn landscaped. Um, I would say for your hillside, it probably would not work because also you're, you're digging down to amend those soils and you're cutting tree roots to do that. I would not ever recommend removing trees for water. It depends on where you are. If you're on, are you on Mount Sequoia? No. Then probably not one. Um, I don't know. That's, well, that's why we have a lot of flooding and mitigation problems. <laughs> I would definitely call uh, with the city to make sure, so don't quote me on that. But always do 811 before you dig. Always do 811 before you dig anywhere, because that's just going to save yourself. Yeah. We just installed a dry creek bed. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, rain gardens, anything. But are you in Fayetteville? Did, and, a and did uh, no permit need it? No, I don't believe that. Not for I if you're. Down to the city, and I, they said I needed to put a size on it. Okay, right. Yes, and uh, yeah, there is definitely a size component to it, but. Um,
because it's the idea is that you're trying to keep water on site, which is going to help the problems that they're having already with the flooding. Terrace landscapes, this is obviously uh, very expensive. Um, unless you own a backhoe, I would put this in the professional, but it's Arkansas, you never know. <laughs> but um, is people, uh, we have a lot of stones, native stones, is to, that, it's just, it's an old school, but it's, it works keeping that sloped soil and then creating berms. It is important not to plant right up to the edge or fill right up to the edge. This one I, I use as a bad example because you see how it's, the ground has been mulched up over. So if you're having erosion or slope coming down, you're probably gonna have wash, wash out here and it's not giving the water a chance to soak in. It's just running, it's gonna run off if it's running across the surface. Um, here where you can see there's, the plants are kind of below the wall, that's gonna catch the water and give it a chance to soak in more. So, um, porous pavers, I love and hate them. Um, they are definitely not something you're gonna tackle yourself. Um, and you definitely need someone to put those in properly because if not, they just become concrete pavers um, if they're not maintained. And um, any way you can break up your landscape to create, to get rid of the concrete, I would appreciate, like that's, that's, that's the goal. You know, again, if you're driving on it and you have a bad driver that keeps driving down that grass strip, not much is gonna happen there. But um, if it's maintained and installed properly, again, these have under drains, these have rocks, there's, there's a very special formula of aggregate you need to use to be able to drive on. Um, however, for your patio that you're not gonna be driving on, these are very much an option. And that gives your patio a chance, but it's, it's very expensive to put in. So that's a, it's a trade out. Um, if that's something you're interested in, again, I can get you more information, but. Do you mow that down? Um, yeah, 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 they do have some that are mowable. A lot of times that they're used as parking areas, the University of Arkansas has one used as a parking area. I think uh, Methodist uh, Church on Dixon has a little uh, grass paper area. And I know that they have to mow theirs, so yeah. So they have to ask, are these LID options right for you? Do you care about a return of investment? Is it something you're trying to do to save money? Not a lot. <laughs> Probably not a lot unless you really are trying to get off the grid back to the cisterns and saving on our water bills. Our water's really cheap in Northwest Arkansas compared to most places. Um, so it's usually not something that's gonna give you a high return. Um, will it solve the problem that I'm having? Are you doing this to solve a drainage problem? Is it gonna solve your problem? And how much are you gonna put in, into it if it's not. What are your water needs? Don't put it in uh, rain barrels if you have no use of those rain barrels. If you're not gonna use that water later, you just have full buckets of water that you then have to maintain to keep mosquitoes out of. So um, volume, how much water are you calculating? That's back to finding out. Don't put in a tiny rain garden and think you're gonna shed all the water off of your entire rooftop into that rain garden. That rain garden's not gonna hold, it has to be designed to spec. Um, and then maintenance long term. Who's gonna be doing the weeding on that? Who's gonna have the chance to, to go back and make sure that those aren't clogged? Um, I will use the Fayetteville Public Library as an example of this. Um, they put in a lovely uh, water catchment system. This is generations ago when they first built this building. Before the renovations, they put in a water system, put in a catchment system, and they were gonna landscape, irrigate out of that catchment system. Well, maintenance contracts go from one person to the next person to the next person. We came in to check on the maintenance of the, the system and the landscape company that had the current contract had no idea there was even a catchment system here. They didn't even know. <laughs> so, cause that got lost in translations from down that maintenance line. All right, so this is our website, knowtheflownwa.com. This actually is gonna walk you through that, um, how to do your site map, how to do, um, uh, a lot of those, uh, every BMP I talked about, so best management practice that I talked about, is gonna be listed under this section. And it's gonna take you to a PDF um, that's gonna give you more detailed um, uh, specs on how to do it. Um, and then it's, if you want, it has that calculation, how to calculate your runoff. On this website's also our publications page, so if you wanna find a, how to um, do a soil test, how to, uh, build a rain garden, how to build a rain barrel. Those things are all in our publications, which if you go to that website, on the top there's a search bar and you can search out whatever term you're looking for and that gives you the University of Arkansas's information if we have it. Um, I will say most of my low impact developments actually um, export it to other extension services that have uh, more research done on low impact development. 
Um, and so that is me, um, and that's my contact information. You guys can email me, phone call, um, office number is there. I am out of work. I'm actually going on vacation starting tomorrow, so I'm out for the rest of the week. But um, other than that, you can contact me. Um, and then uh, I did want to comment just back to that uh, making a complaint. I don't know if I am logged. Let me see if I'm logged into Wi-Fi real quick, and I'll show you. If not, um, what you can do is go to the City of Fayetteville's website. All of the local cities will have, yeah, I'm not hooked up. Um, all the local cities will have a way to complain about stormwater issues. So no matter what city you are, pretty much if you're in Northwest Arkansas, they should have an avenue of how to complain about stormwater issues. Most of the time, the answer is going to be, we don't, we can't help you. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the way the rules and ordinances are written. Um, and so there's some push to try to get them changed. So just so you know, but there is an official complaint form. Um, they have to have that on site or on their website or available to you. So even if you guys email me, I can probably direct you to your specific city's um, complaint process. Um, usually it's an anonymous for form. The city of Bentonville will not let you do it anonymously. They want to know who you are because they want to follow up with you. Um, and so you go to the website, look up, try to Google, search their website of something like, you know, complaint process. It will probably be hidden down with like, um, uh, you know, uh, water, trash, you know, in their departments, put that in there. Um, for the city of Fayetteville, it's Alan Pugh. He, he won't care if I give you his name. <laughs> That's his job. Alan Pugh. He's a, he, Alan Pugh, P-U-G-H. <laughs> He'll love me. I'm sure you have. Ever, ever, he, that's his job, though. He is the stormwater person. That's what he gets. Like, that's, he knew what he got when he took the job. Um, and so he's a civil engineer and, um, and works with stormwater. And so if there are drainage issues, that's the first point of contact for the city. And again, likely going to tell you there's nothing we can do about you. Because if it's on your property, it's out of the city's right away. That's what they'll tell you. Yeah. So if it's coming from their thing, yeah, that's, that's, that's an issue. You, he'll come out to your site and take a look at it and, and start you from there. It's, it's a process, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have to get permission to, to put in your own curb cut? If it's, yes, to put in a curb cut, you will need, I would suggest if calling from the city. There are some cities who just do not allow it at all. Can you ask Alan Pew about it? Yeah, and Alan said, you do. You call Alan and he's the first point of contact. Yep, he's okay, the one. Well, what is his phone number? It's 575. <laughs> And I can't remember the last four digits right now. Actually, Brad's going to Google it real quick. He'll, if you Google it, it's, it's, it's right there. Um, and he, uh, again, he'll help you out. He's, he's real. Alan is used to, to hearing complaints. That's part of his job. Um, but again, if it's, he also has access to resources or direct you to resources um, that might be able to help you. Um, those that are in the Illinois River watershed, right now they have some funding for low impact development installations. Um, I don't know how much of that's on private property they can put in, but that is an option. Well, I do know that it's the Fayetteville Transportation Division that the stormwater is part of. It is. He's, he's in, it's engineering. So you have, stormwater is tricky because you have but the transport. I've been to the website, and it's the transportation, it's under the transportation. transportation. Right. And the number is, ready, 575-8228. That's right. Do you want Alan's? Do you have Alan's number? 8208. 8208? 8208? Yeah. So Alan Fuse is 575-8208. And that'll get you directly to Alan. Again, he's an engineer. He's in the engineering department. So his job is the, the design, the planning, the maintenance, and the, the inspection of our storm drain system. And transportation, they're responsible for the actual physical maintenance of them. He's the design side. And then there are the actual, like if you have a clogged storm drain, um, that has probably gotten debris in there. Transportation is the one who comes out and cleans that out for you. Yes. yes. On the street where I live in uh -huh. we are currently getting yeah, new get storm drains. It, okay. The whole street's been destroyed to do this. Where are you at? Just curious. I'm on Stanton Avenue. Okay. And so I just as went now, I want to know what they could do before they get everything finished and a new road uh, or, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they actually, um, that was part of the bond process. Yeah. yeah. I think the men are out there working are going to be able to help me with this. No, I would, no, I would, I would call Alan and talk with him for sure. Eric, if you want to go ahead and get hooked up on <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so there are, there are avenues. I, it never hurts to ask the question. I don't think, and no one's going to be upset that you called and say, I'm getting flooded, and I think you have something to do with it. They're just going to ignore you, which is what happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you become persistent. <laughs> yeah, you can try, right, exactly. So, um, and so I, that's the end of mine. Um, again, we're going to take a 10 minute break. Um, Eric's going to get set up um, and talk about this. So, this is Eric Fusler and, um, with Olson. That's my computer. Yeah, you can take a USB. It's, uh, it's going to be on the adapter. It's probably where the. Hold on. Thank you, James. Thank, thank you guys. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, what you got? Yeah, we're going to do a five minute break and then you guys can be back. Use restrooms or whatever.
All right, well, my name's Eric Fuselay. Um, work for a company called Olson. Uh, we're an engineering firm here in Fayetteville. Uh, one of the things we do design is uh, stormwater uh, type projects for local cities, city of Bentonville, whatnot. But I'm also mostly here to represent an organization called Wild Ones Natural, Native Plants Natural Landscapes. We're a volunteer nonprofit organization. It's been around for more than 30 years. We have a local chapter here in uh, Northwest Arkansas called the Ozark Chapter. Uh, nationwide, we have over 70, 72 chapters plus 23 what we call seedling chapters. These are the little chapters that are trying to get started and haven't become fully chartered yet. Uh, currently, I mentioned our only chapter in Arkansas is the Ozark chapter. We have a little over 90 members. Uh, our goal is to promote the use of native plants in the landscape environment and try to teach people how can you uh, incorporate more natives into your gardens and landscaping and how can we uh, landscape things to be more environmentally friendly. Well, we provide monthly educational programs on the first Thursday of each month. These are free and open to the public. Uh, the last one we had in June was right here at the Fayetteville Public Library. Dr. Westerman from the U of A came and gave a program on um, butterfly behavior and ecology, which is awesome. Uh, you can view that program and all of our other recorded programs on our YouTube channel. I encourage you to go to YouTube, type in Wild Ones Ozark Chapter to find that. Uh, our national organization also has its own YouTube channel. You got to type in YouTube or Wild Ones cha uh, channel. If you just type in Wild Ones, you get all kinds of different results on YouTube. So, but the Wild Ones channel, we have everything from webinars given by Doug Tallamy to all kinds of other leaders in the natural landscaping movement. Uh, nationally and at our chapter level, we both offer quarterly journals. Uh, all of our issues are free uh, and open to the public. You can go on our website. Uh, you can sign up to get on our email list, and I'll give you our contact info in a second. Uh, each one includes all kinds of great articles on the use of native plants and landscaping, as well as news and announcements of what we have going on in the region. We also have free, offer free consultation services to people who live in Northwest Arkansas. If you're needing to know where to get started, or maybe you have an invasive species, you just don't know what it is or how to deal with it, uh, maybe you're just wondering what will grow in a certain part of your yard, given the sunlight, whatnot uh, conditions. Uh, go to our website, that's ozark.wildwinds.org. There's a tab up there called Free Consult. You click on that, and that'll take you to a page uh, that'll have a link uh, that you go fill out a Google form that gets sent to our team of volunteers, and somebody will reach out and set up a time. Uh, we, spend, we send people out in pairs. Uh, they spend a maximum of one hour out at your site, and then uh, they'll go back and type up an email uh, just with all the recommendations and list of species that uh, could, you can use to get planted. So, so far, uh, since we started this in 2020, uh, we provided this service to over 50 homeowners, including one HOA uh, and even uh, a school um, down in Fayetteville. Uh, we're working with um, to help them get more native plants that are going to have more of an educational value as well for their science courses. And if you want to join, members.wildwinds.org slash join. You can join for as low as $25 uh, a year. Uh, that's our base level membership for those on our students or limited income. The next level up is $40 for a household. That gets everyone in your household a membership or two adults and however many kids you have. Okay. Yes, this one? Okay, sure. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Oh, my name is Eric Fuselier, uh, E-R-I-C, then last name, F-U-S-E-L-I-E-R. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And I'll have my contact info up later, too. All right, so rain gardens. Uh, I'm going to kind of focus or kind of expand a little bit on what Jane had talked about, um, go into a little more of the, uh, some of the specific uh, techniques she discussed, uh, and kind of go into how you could you know, go about constructing one of these on your own if it's within your um, you know, capability. But Jane already talked a little bit about rain gardens, but I'll just kind of rehash or re, uh, kind of go over it just briefly a little bit. Uh, what are rain gardens? Well, these are these shallow constructed depressions that have been planted with deep-rooted perennial flowers and native vegetation. Uh, we, are, we strategically locate these to capture runoff from impervious surfaces. Uh, after a rain, water comes off that impervious surface, whether it be a parking lot, driveway, uh, your roof of your house, uh, whatnot, fills with a few inches of water after a rainfall. This helps to slow down this uh, storm water and gives it more time uh, to soak into the soil. Uh, so allows for more time for soil infiltration. I'll go into a little bit uh, here later on about how that helps improve the quality of that storm water. So what are the benefits of rain garden? They can provide localized flood control. 
They reduce the flow intensity of creeks during storm events. Uh, this is because as this rain has fallen on the landscape, and Jane might have gone into this, um, I showed up a little late, had it wrong on my calendar. I thought it started at 11. I apologize. Uh, so if I cover some stuff, it's just going to be a little bit of a review for y'all. Uh, but the, uh, the more water that's allowed to be slowed down, stored during these rain events, less of it's being transferred to a storm drain into the nearest creek. And so these flashier flows are reduced that way. It's more time to uh, infiltrate into the soil. Uh, so that what that does is that helps um, reduce erosion downstream. Also, as it's going into the soil, there's all kinds of uh, biology, microorganisms, plant roots, uh, plant you know, plants themselves will help uh, take up and uh, break down some of these contaminants. Uh, so this helps improve stormwater quality. This also helps uh, recharge groundwater supplies. The more water that's going into the soil, more of it's reaching the groundwater. As the opposite is if you, more of it's running off, less of it's getting into the soil, recharging groundwater. And here in Northwest Arkansas, where we had that karst geology, uh, that groundwater supply is really important for maintaining uh, po like Ozark cavefish populations, certain uh, populations that are threatened and endangered. So uh, you go out to Cave Springs in the Illinois River Watershed Partnership. They have a um, uh, cave there that uh, water's coming out of, but that in that cave is uh, the largest, I believe, known population of Ozark cavefish. And so a lot of Northwest Arkansas is within the recharge area uh, for that cave ecosystem. So. Uh, here in Northwest Arkansas, the more that we can encourage stormwater, if you want to call it encourage, uh, to soak into the ground, the better off those cavefish populations will be. Also, the more uh, that we're recharging groundwater, uh, we're also helping sustain creek flows during the dry months. Uh, perennial and intermittent streams are uh, a large part of their, what contributes to their flow is the water table. So uh, when that water table is high um, or can stay high for as long as possible, then these streams can flow longer throughout the year. Perennial streams tend to flow typically throughout the year, but intermittent streams will often dry up uh, during the dry summer months. So whenever that water table gets down below the bed of the stream. Another benefit of rain gardens, especially if we're using native vegetation, is they provide habitat. Uh, for birds, butterflies, beneficial insects, uh, can also enhance the beauty of your yard or neighborhood or business, um, depending on where you want to put one of these. All right, so what about the history? Look, a little bit of history of rain gardens. And I had a water right around in that door uh, in a glass. Would you be able to? My mouth is drying up. I need a rain garden for my mouth. There. Thank you. All right, so we don't have to go too far back um, to where rain gardens were first conceived of, just as far back as 1990, or as my kids like to call it, the late 1900s, because they like for me to feel old. But in 1990, Somerset, Maryland, there was a subdivision originally designed with stormwater detention ponds, curb and gutter, and sidewalks. You know, the typical, or I won't want to say traditional method, but the 20th century way of uh, dealing with stormwater are these curving gutter systems, like you see in that photo there. Uh, however, every time, way they kept designing it, they kept running into it being way too expensive to develop, and every company that tried to develop the subdivision would uh, come to bankruptcy. Uh, so they decided to replace these stormwater management features with open drainage swells, and these are basically linear rain gardens, areas that are meant to transport stormwater while also slowing it down and giving it more time to infiltrate into the soil, as well as rain gardens on each lot. And this is where that idea was conceived of. The goal was to uh, mimic the, the uh, bioretention, or I'm sorry, was to design bioretention to mimic the naturally occurring functions that existed in nature before humans began to alter uh, the earth's surface features. And these are some photos of uh, these rain gardens. They weren't all using native vegetation at that time, but uh, the idea of the rain garden uh, began. So the HOA maintains the rain gardens that are located in the common areas and ensures that the homeowners maintain their individual rain gardens. So I've always never enjoyed the idea of living in an HOA where they you know, dictate how you do things in your yard, but this might be one that I wouldn't mind uh, living in. So. 
the homeowners would sign an, sign an agreement acknowledging that they are aware of the function of those rain gardens. And they would be provided with education on the purpose of the rain garden as well as how to maintain them. So that way they're not just handing these over with requirements of you got to maintain this without telling them, well, what I do. Uh, this provided a cost advantage. So the reduction in infrastructure and the construction cost facilitated a cost uh, effective development of that subdivision. So this reduction allowed also for wider roads to accommodate pedestrian traffic. So it was just an all around win win. And uh, ever since then, you get this idea, they eventually became termed the rain gardens and the idea spread out from there and became adopted by other cities, uh, landowners, whatnot. So if we'll talk a little bit here about rain garden planning and design, and part of this is also going to apply to other stormwater um, type landscaping, whether it be bioswells, terracing, that sort of thing. So first of all, what do we do? We choose a location. Always need a location. Maybe you have a low area in your yard where water's already wanting to drain to, all right? Uh, Jane probably mentioned conducting an umbrella survey. So you go out when it's raining, you're getting a good rain, see where's water already like to flow to. Uh, now, if you have an area where it's collecting and it doesn't seem to drain well in that area, then you need to make note of that because you might have to replace the soil uh, so that it drains better. But what this does, it at least allows you to see where does water already like to go. So these low areas in the yard that tend to puddle may need to replace the soil. You can uh, choose a location, say, down stream of the discharge point of an impervious surface. Here you have this curb cut that a uh, lady had mentioned earlier. So it's right by, it looks like a roadway, except uh, stormwater from the roadway into uh, the rain garden there. So once you've decided on your location, of course, you always call 811 or it's 311 around here, I can't recall, um, to, so they can come out and mark um, any lines. Uh, also keep it 10, 15 feet off of a foundation of your house as well. So you don't want water puddling up around your house. Then you need to determine the soil texture that is at that location. Uh, soil texture refers to the combination of sand, silt, and clay particles in various proportions. If you have too much clay, that's going to prevent uh, water from being able to infiltrate the soil. It's going to make it difficult. It's going to puddle more. So you want to be able to have enough infiltration uh, one way you can determine uh, the amount of clay that you have, or if you have too much clay or not, is called a ribbon test. And I believe there might still be someone from the extension office and come out and show you how to do a ribbon test on your soil. But basically, you just take a handful of soil, you moisten it, uh, pu pull it up, push it all together into a ball, and then you start to push it between your thumb and index finger to form this ribbon here. And if that ribbon is longer than an inch, you probably have too much clay in your soil. You want it to be less than an inch or to not ribbon at all. If it, well, if it doesn't ribbon at all, you probably don't have enough. So between zero and one inches. Typically, if it's a pure sand, it will not ribbon at all. Uh, and you don't, you know, pure sand is not going to do well for uh, a garden of any kind. Uh, but whenever it's an inch or greater, you're getting into soil class, te uh, textural classes that are going to have contain too much clay, like clay loams and um, silty clays, sandy clays, that sort of thing. So here is a diagram that shows um, the different soil textures uh, and how they affect uh, permeability. You have the sand, you have these larger uh, sand particles. Sand is basically the type of soil uh, mineral particle that is the largest. Uh, they, um, because they're larger, they have larger pore space in between, so water is able to get through there much easier. Uh, a sandy loam. Uh, loams have a more or less even mixture of sand and silt. Uh, silt are those particles that are, you know, not quite as big as sand, but not as small as clay. Uh, these are going to be ideal uh, for a rain garden. You're going to have uh, moderate infiltration. Clay particles are much smaller, so the pore space is much, much smaller in between these. Uh, water has a more difficult time getting through these, um, and so what you end up is ponding or even runoff. So. Like I mentioned, uh, sandy loam is going to be the one you're going for. Uh, if you don't already have a sandy loam there, um, uh, oh, hold on one second. Okay. What can you do if you don't already have a sandy loam there? Um, well, one thing is to add compost. Compost acts as a natural glue. Uh, binding uh, a lot of soil particles together. 
will help uh, kind of clump up some of that soil and help um, facilitate more infiltration. Uh, that can be kind of difficult, um, uh, just depending, like if you're trying to till in something that's pure clay, uh, that can be a lot of work. Uh, it depends on also how deep that clay goes. It might go deeper uh, than you can till or work it in. Um, so uh, same with sand. Uh, you can add sand to your um, uh, soil. That's the great thing about soil texture is it can be changed. So, or loamy topsoil. You want to make sure that loamy topsoil, if you do order it, uh, does not contain any clay, though, or very little clay. Yes, Diana? Um, how deep are we talking that we have to look at the soil? Because I think if we're looking at the, you know, subdivisions, we've got maybe a topsoil mm -hmm. Yeah, and typically rain garden, and uh, you typically design a rain garden, or at least a soil part, uh, three to six inches, uh, it varies, and then you could have an under drain pipe, and I'll go into that here in just a little bit to help uh, if you can't go any deeper than that, or if you're limited by depth on how you can uh, facilitate additional drainage as well. But typically uh, three to six inches is what you're looking at, yeah. So if you're wanting to just put together your own soil mixture, say you've just determined that the soil there is not going to work, so you're going to need to excavate out uh, the, the native soil there. Uh, typically, an ideal soil mixture is going to be 40 to 50 percent sand, 20 to 30 percent topsoil without clay. Make sure there's not clay in that topsoil, uh, and 30 percent compost. The compost is going to be where a lot of the nutrients come from. Uh, not all the nutrients. Some of the nutrients do come from the mineral portion of the soil, but compost definitely uh, provides a lot of the nitrogen and whatnot that's already uh, bioavailable. All right, next, what's the shape and size of a rain garden or a bioswell? Um, typically, you know, with the bioswell, if you already have an area of your yard that's draining, I visited a lady's house um, a couple months ago on Mount Sequoia, and there was this side of the house where up uphill, uh, the neighbor had their drainage, they, the, the pipe was exposed right there, it was coming right out, draining right down her side of her property and into the road. Um, and it was just like this shallow little drainage that you can see there, Not, you know, it's having trouble growing stuff, and she was wondering, well, what can I plant here? You know, what can I do here? Um, so we gave her some recommendations, you know, that would be a great area for a bioswell or even have an occasional terrace just to kind of help slow the water, contain it uh, periodically as it comes down the slope, and uh, provided a list of plants that would grow in uh, a situation like that. But if you're wanting to do just a rain garden, first size, okay? A general rule of thumb uh, is uh, the rain garden, if you're dealing with residential size scale rain gardens, uh, you want them to be about a third of the area that is gonna be draining to it, or a third of the impervious area that's draining to it. However, if you really wanna get more specific, the U of A Extension Office has a great um, PDF out there with a table um, on how to determine the size of your rain garden. Uh, based on the surface area that's impermeable, and if your rain garden size, if you're going to have it be six feet deep, then there's all the, there's these options that you can go with, versus three feet deep, you have some other options. That's a great resource uh, to kind of determine uh, the dimensions. Yeah, did I say feet? Yeah. Okay, yeah. You want it to be three to six inches deep, sorry. Yeah. But the dimensions of the, from the top-down view, the plan view, is going to be in feet. Yeah, so, sorry, yeah. Uh, the University of Arkansas Extension Office. Extension Office. Yeah. Uh, that's that, that's that. If you went to that go.soil.com, go.soil.wa.com, on the top, that's the extension website for my page. It'll all search together, your search and search bar. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, basically just a third is a rule of thumb of the impervious surface that's draining into your rain garden. How much does aeration help in the yard if you have storm runoff? How much does what now? Aerating the entire yard. How much does that help to avoid the... When you say aerating, how do, how do you mean? I'm not familiar with that. Do you like perforate your yard or do you have like permanently installed pipes that let air out or? No, 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 no. It's just perforating. It's just, 
Oh, okay. I would imagine that would help for a while, uh, but you know, but eventually that soil would fill back in. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the area and how much rain you're getting, all that stuff. I mean, it would depend on various factors. I would imagine that would help in, uh, facilitate more infiltration, um, but um, it's a possibility. Uh, but then it look, you know, you're looking also at how much, uh, what's the water holding capacity of your soil, you know. Some places around here you got a restrictive layer like bedrock pretty close, and so once the soil becomes saturated, that's when runoff uh, is going to start happening. So, I mean, if, if you end up with soil that's native, not able to uh, hold all the storm water, then that's when you might look at landscaping options uh, that will help slow down and store that runoff, like a rain garden or something like bioswell or terracing, something like that. So, but if it seems to be working just fine for you, then I'd just leave it. Okay, gotcha. Well, it's worth a try. I haven't heard of that, but I would think that if you're increasing channels for the water to get into the soil, then you're, in, you're improving the infiltration rate of the soil that way. Yeah. All right, so then you know what size you want it. You know where you want it. You know uh, whether or not you need to replace the soil or whether the soil there is already good. What are your next steps? Well, uh, you can either excavate or fill. Say if you're on a slope, uh, you might add a little berm, and I'll go into a little more details on that. I will say, though, if you do this in your front yard and you have this construction tape, don't use the police crime scene tape because your neighbors will think you have some bodies buried in your front yard. So just a word of warning, be careful, or might explain to your neighbors what you're doing so they're not all suddenly worried. But for level areas, uh, excavate to about a consistent depth. Uh, of course, the base of your rain garden can be sloped tight, slightly towards the downstream end. That'll help uh, that end hold more uh, water in that soil uh, as it rains. Uh, however, if you're dealing with a slope, like many of our yards are here in Northwest Arkansas, uh, there's a technique you can use here. Um, and the literature I've read has recommended working in like uh, 10, uh, five to 10 feet increments. So. If your rain guard's only 10 feet long, uh, you should be fine. Uh, this will basically you stick a sl uh, stakes on either end, tie a string between those, make sure that string is level. You can have a level out there. The longer the level, the better uh, to determine how level that is. And then you're gonna work your way down from that. So that gives you a constant elevation that you can measure down from to make sure that the base of your rain garden is a constant elevation or slope slightly towards the downstream end. So maybe, you know, five inches down or three inches down, or you gotta take into account the height of the stake, of course, too, uh, but you wanna go three to six inches into the dirt, and then, you know, you might go a little bit deeper on the downstream end, so. And as you're excavating uphill, move that downhill to kind of create that berm. So here's uh, an example with um, a less severe slope uh, versus an example with a more severe slope where they not only excavated and used a fill for the berm, but they also uh, had to kind of build up the slope on the downhill side there, kind of get something that's consistent throughout. All right, what about some other considerations? What else do we need to think about uh, when we're designing or constructing our rain garden? And that's where under drains come in handy. Uh, these are good when you're near sensitive infrastructure or the potential for flooding is likely. Uh, this involves, um, basically you have that rain garden cross section. Earlier, this is the dirt uh, that uh, water's filtering into. Then you have a drain pipe here uh, covered with this aggregate, uh, what's called a filter material or filter blanket over that drain pipe. Uh, this drain pipe uh, is typically perforated along through it. That way as water filters through the soil, it's able to get in that pipe. Uh, flows to it and then uh, leaves it um, off site. So here's a storm water coming off an impervious surface into the rain garden. Um, so these are also good when you're filtering storm water uh, that originates on gas stations and other uh, pollutant hot spots. However, uh, depending on the level of contaminants, you uh, might need an impermeable liner below your rain garden to prevent contamination of groundwater. So. Uh, just keep that in mind depending on what's near uh, where you're wanting to build this thing. Also, uh, soils with inadequate infiltration rates, you know, say it's just everything you've tried, nothing seems to be working, you can't get that soil texture how you need it, uh, and so installing an under drain just might be your uh, an option, last resort kind of option to get this thing to drain right. 
you know, maybe your rain garden just seems to be ponding too much and uh, is becoming a source of mosquitoes. And then there are elevated under drains, similar concept, except uh, the under drain itself is elevated a little bit more from the bottom, you know, and the more of that aggregate filter blankets put below it. Uh, these uh, are handy when the nitrates are a concern, so uh, excess nitrogen coming from uh, fertilizer, um, a farm field where manure or whatnot is put. Um, something, you know, if you have a neighbor that is having a uh, uphill from you that's having their yard sprayed with uh, nitrogen fertilizer from time to time, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and it's that fluctuating anaerobic, aerob aerobic zone. Anaerobic meaning uh, lack of oxygen, aerobic, oxygen is present. Uh, that helps uh, facilitate the denitrification process. And the reason for that, uh, basically when water comes in, it fills up this area, uh, then it's all anaerobic. You start to have uh, these anaerobic microorganisms that, will, that are involved in the first part of uh, breaking down uh, those nitrates into uh, gaseous or volatile forms. And then they've turned it into, I can't remember which form it is, but then as the water goes down, and I bet Brad or Jane could be able to tell you the chemical form names, but then you get the aerobic organisms take over, and then they continue the chemical uh, reaction to convert it to uh, gaseous nitrogen um, forms, and then it can kind of go into the air. So uh, you want that alternating um, water level in that sort of situation. So that's why you put the drain pipe uh, a little bit higher, because uh, it helps uh, get the water off uh, so you can kind of create those conditions. Another thing is your inlet here. Uh, you can install an inlet that's uh, at the elevation that you don't want the water level to go beyond. So that way when the water, when the grain gardens fills up, it goes into this inlet and then goes to your drain pipe um, and off site. So that's just kind of one way of controlling the level of water in your rain garden uh, during those heavy flows. And you see back here, like here is uh, the outlet that, uh, you know, as it fills up too, water will um, exit the rain garden here. And sometimes you can put a bioswell on that end. Uh, when I was at my previous company, we would design our rain gardens with a bioswell on uh, to where as the rain garden would fill up, it would then overflow into that bioswell that would provide a little more uh, chance to slow down the storm water and uh, let it filter into the soil before it entered. Uh, this was one near Beaver Lake, so we we're just trying to give it every chance we could to improve water quality before uh, stormwater coming from a, an area was entering the lake. And then to assess your rain garden function, uh, this requires going to the Web Soil Survey, which is a website maintained by the Natural Resources Conservation Service. If you Google Web Soil Survey, it usually comes up. And you get on there and you look at your um, you have to do what, create what's called an area of interest. So you start off with this um, GIS kind of map. It's kind of clunky of the United States. You got to zoom in to where your property is or where you're uh, planting your rain garden. Um, and then you create an area of interest around the area um, um, where you have your rain garden. And then it will pull up all kinds of information about the soils there. Uh, so then you have to go tab over a little bit to, uh, to soil properties and look up what's called the... Um, hydrologic soil group, and basically your soil will be divided into uh, one of four groups. So once you know your hydrologic soil group, uh, there are some calculations you can run looking at the recharge volume and the site imperviousness to find out if your rain garden is functioning uh, at a level that is comparable to what was there before uh, the native environment there. So um, usually you can find out more about this technique online um, but that's just one way to kind of assess, you know, is your rain garden uh, a good replacement for what, what was previously there? Sir? Yes. What is the website for that map? Uh, web Soil Survey. Web Soil Survey. Yep. Com? No, it, I would Google that. It's, on, it's got some long government, you know, URL type thing, but it's um, put out by, like, Natural Resources Conservation Service. They used to have the county soil surveys and books. And then when, you know, the internet was invented, they put it all online, so it stopped uh, printing the books. So, yep. All right, so now you have your rain garden, you've decided the location, you got it all built, you need to plant it. How do you decide what plants go there? Uh, again, again, this applies to your bioswell as well. Um, 
So uh, choose native species. Why do we choose native species? Like I said, they originally didn't start off in these rain gardens with native species, but you know, I highly encourage you to choose native plants because they are already part of the web of life. And so when we're impacting the uh, changing the land, uh, replacing natural habitat with um, impervious surfaces, parking lots, buildings, neighborhoods, turf lawns, we are removing that habitat, and making it more difficult for pollinator species to survive. I mean, consider monarch butterflies. They leave the mountains in Mexico every uh, spring, migrate up to northern Canada, and then migrate back and come back to Mexico uh, by late summer or fall. Uh, what do they rely on along the migration routes? Anybody? Milkweed, right. And so monarch populations have really taken a hit in recent decades because we've changed the land so much that there's not a mu as much milkweed along their flyways. So that's why a lot of people are trying to use more milkweed in their gardens as well. Plus, you know, you get to see that monarch come through uh, twice a year. That's kind of a benefit as well. So, um, but I like this quote by John Muir, who's one of my favorite naturalists. Uh, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And so when we're pat using native plants, we're helping patch back in some of that habitat, helping to reweave some of that web of life back into our gardens, back into the built environment. So not only, you know, if you are planting, if you like birds, plant native plants because they're going to attract pollinators. Birds come to consume the larvae, the caterpillars of those uh, pollinators, feed them to their young. And so you're going to have more birds in your yard. Uh, especially hummingbirds or certain plant species that are that hummingbirds love, especially these red flowers with long corollas uh, like trumpet honeysuckle, uh, uh, cardinal flower. Uh, so, I mean, you know, why waste money and time on having hummingbird feeders? You got to refill and all that. You can just have a beautiful flower there that's going to bring them anyway. So uh, there's just uh, a benefit to knowing which native species to plant that um, you know, require less work on, on our parts to kind of bring the wildlife that we enjoy viewing from our windows. So when we want to look at uh, which plants would grow well in a certain area, uh, it's going to kind of depend. Is your rain garden going to be in full open sun all day long? Is it going to be uh, partially shaded throughout part of the day? Uh, is it going to be in full shade throughout all the day? So you want to know where do uh, a certain species like to grow in nature, and that's Part of where it can kind of come in handy to know where these species like to grow in the wild, but a lot of times you can find information out there on the internet uh, that will let you know this. There's also a great website, Missouri Botanical Gardens, which has great information on different uh, native species uh, and what their growth preferences are or uh, site condition preferences, but generally we're going to look at soil moisture, soil pH, and sunlight. Now, soil moisture, we're dealing with rain gardens. That's what's going to be important. Uh, in this case, so where you plant a particular species is going to uh, make a difference. So we can rely on what are called the wetland indicator statuses uh, for this. Uh, these are these were developed by uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, they're uh, responsible for enforcing the Clean Water Act. Uh, so um, certain waterways and wetlands are regulated, considered jurisdictional waters. In order to impact them through construction projects, you have to get a permit, and so that's where they hire. Uh, environmental professionals like myself, if somebody is wanting to build a development a roadway, they know, okay, do I have any wetlands out here? And if I do, how many? And will we need to have a permit? And will we have to do any mitigation? That sort of thing. So you got to go out, find all the, you know, categorize the plants, figure out where that boundary, that wetland is. So where are the wetland plants on one side and the upland plants on the other? And that's where these indicator statuses up here at the top uh, help you determine that. Uh, but we can apply that here uh, with this, uh, with rain garden design, because uh, we start off with OBL and FACW, which stands for Obligate Wetland and Facultative Wetland Species. Uh, obligate wetland plants like to be at or just above the low water mark. So consider a pond that always has water in it, right? Well, during the dry summer months, like we have now, that water level is going to go down a little bit. Well, those uh, obligate wetland plants, things like cattails, uh, button bush, uh, they're going to be able to handle that periodic um, mud flat that happens there. But as soon as that water comes back up, they can handle the inundation. Uh, these typically are not going to be great for most rain gardens. These are going to be better for like an aquascaping uh, type project or your pond edge, that sort of thing. Uh, facultative wetland species are at or just above the high, the average water mark. So. Um, 
you know, they are able to ha you know, handle whenever the water is at its average level, a little bit of inundation, as well as after a heavy rain, that water level goes up and then back down. So you get that high water mark, then it comes back down to average levels. Uh, so these are going to be able to do a little bit better in the lower area of your rain garden as rainwater is passing through there uh, after the rain events. Facultative species, these like these transition zones between wet and dry areas. Uh, these like to be above the high water level. Um, oh, I'm sorry, at or above the high water level. Uh, so these, um, you know, will be dry most of the time, but after rain, water comes through there. So these would do much better also in a rain garden at the bottom or even on the uphill part of a rain garden, the upstream side where water is going to pass through. Or as you might put facultative wetland species on the downslope side where water might stick around a little bit longer. And then if you have a berm around your rain garden, you're going to choose what are called facultative upland and upland species. And so to find out what the wetland indicator status is for a particular species, uh, you can go straight to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers website is one way to do it. It's a little less user friendly. But if you uh, Google um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers National Wetland Plant List, that'll it'll take you to where you can download an Excel spreadsheet of all these different species that they've assigned these wetland indicator statuses to. Uh, and you can look up your, your plant from there. Uh, another way is to go to plants.usda.gov. This is the much easier way to go about it uh, because once you go to that website, you can type in uh, the plant name It'll take you to the profile for that plant, and then there's a tab it's called wetland that you can click on, and it'll show you what the wetland indicator status is for your species. Plants.usda.gov, so U.S. Department of Agriculture.gov, uh, and you, we are, you know, different species have different indicator statuses depending on what part of the country they're found in, all right? So there are some species that grow all over the United States. Um, and so you want to make sure that you're looking at the indicator status for where you're wanting your rain garden to be. And so currently here in Fayetteville, we are in what's called the Eastern Mountain and Piedmont region. We're kind of lumped in with the, the Appalachians just because we're so similar in climate and topography. If you're in southern or eastern Arkansas, that is where they define as the Atlantic Gulf Coastal Plain. So go a little bit further over into Oklahoma, you get into their Midwestern region and then the Great Plains region. Uh, so you just want to make sure that you're looking at where your rain garden is located and what region uh, the Corps has assigned for your indicator status. And then make sure you're, because some of them vary between region and region, some of them are more consistent. All right, so what about sunlight duration? Well, native plants that like full sun, these are going to prefer prairies, glades. Uh, these open areas, so if your rain garden is in an open area where nothing's going to obstruct the sun, that would be ideal. Uh, South-facing slopes um, often will get a lot of more sun. Uh, North-facing slopes here in the Ozarks uh, get less sun because uh, we are in the northern hemisphere, so the sun is slightly uh, to the south. So uh, if the slope is tall enough uh, and you're far enough down, then sometimes these locations never get sun throughout the day or the south side of a house or building. Native plants for partial sun include open woodlands, forest edges, prairies, glades sometimes too. Uh, sometimes these places, these plants are also adapted to the occasional obstruction of sunlight. So planting on your east or west side of the building is gonna be helpful there. Native plants for full suns are typically adapted to living under closed canopy forest. Uh, most plant species prefer uh, more sunlight um, but uh, there are a few that prefer full shade. So planting on north side of house or building or north facing slope uh, is gonna be ideal for these species. All right, so let's get into some specific species. Uh, some facultative wetland species, these would go in the low area of your rain garden, more likely on the uh, downstream side, so uh, where it's gonna contain moisture a little longer. So New England aster likes full sun. Notice I have these sun symbols here in the corner. Cardinal flower likes full sun to partial shade. Uh, this is a hummingbird magnet that I mentioned earlier. If you uh, like uh, hummingbirds, you want to attract them to your yard, plant some of these. Uh, great blue labelia, another uh, full sun, partial sun species. It's a facultative wetland species. 
Uh, Labellia cephalitica is a species, it gets a species name because it was once used to treat syphilis. A little interesting factoid about that plant. Uh, nine bark uh, is also a full sun to partial sun. It has these beautiful uh, blooms on it. I see it growing a lot along uh, stream banks, which would make sense with it being a facultative wetland species. All right, facultative. So these are going to uh, like to be above that um, average water level, but they can handle periodic uh, water flowing through them. So this is going to be like, you know, maybe in the bottom of your rain garden, but on the upstream side, or you can also put these on the berms as well. Rough leaf goldenrod, orange cone flower, like full sun, rattlesnake master. A friend of mine once told me that she thought rattlesnake master would be a really awesome heavy metal band name. So, <laughs> uh, I agree. I think that would be an awesome name for a heavy metal band. I would go see them. I don't listen to as much heavy metal as I did when I was younger, but I, I would go see one of them now. Maybe even get in the mosh pit. I don't know. Uh, Foxglove beard tongue, Pinstamen digitalis. Eastern blue star, one of our Amsonias. It's a beautiful uh, plant. Uh, blooms in May. Likes full sun to partial sun. Joe pie weed. This gets pretty tall, five to seven feet. Uh, also great for attracting pollinators. Golden Alexander, this one blooms uh, in the spring, made through June. It's about done right now. And then if you want to add a shrub, uh, northern spice bush. So this is a host plant for the spice bush swallowtail butterfly. Uh, also is uh, edible. Uh, the leaves you can use to make a tea. Uh, if you ever take spice bush leaf, crush it up, smell it. It has a very citrusy scent. Uh, makes a delicious tea. Uh, during the winter time, you can uh, take the twigs, crush those up, make a tea with that as well. It's very delicious. These berries uh, are used as an allspice substitute. Take them, let them dry out. They'll turn like a dark purple, almost a, like a black, purplish black color. Uh, and then crush them up and use them in place of allspice. Last fall, my daughter and I went out and collected some of these. And then she and my wife used them for our pumpkin pie at Thanksgiving. So um, it's a wonderful allspice substitute. And it blooms uh, around the same time the forsythia bushes bloom. And they both bloom, of course, yellow flowers, uh, so they can look very similar from a distance. Uh, but usually before any leaves are on the tree, you'll see these in bloom uh, closer uh, you know, to water or north slopes, that sort of thing. They're a facultative species, so uh, they tend to not like it in too dry areas. All right, so what about facultative upland species? Well, full sun, we can have some downy flocks. You know, this would be ideal for on a berm or around the edges of a bioswell, a little higher up where the water is not going to be flowing through. Prairie beard tongue, one of our other penstemons. Purple beard tongue. And then what's top, typically called butterfly weed, but I'm jumping on the Doug Tallamy bandwagon. He's trying to rebrand this Monarch's Delight. Because we have an issue we have in the native plant landscaping communities. We have the word weed in too many of our plant names. And a weed is supposed to be something you don't want growing somewhere, right? Uh, so that just kind of sends the wrong message. People are like, oh, that's a weed. I want to get that out. It's like, but, so if we can recall it something different, Monarch's Delight, that really explains the value that this uh, plant has in the ecosystem. So I'm, uh, so far, uh, my wife's on the bandwagon, and she's gotten her six-year-old on the bandwagon. Now it's all in bloom. We're riding around. She called, my six-year-old calls it butterflies to light, which that's good enough. So uh, just trying to spread the word uh, on that because uh, I think Doug telling me he's on to something good there. Purple milkweed, full sun. Common milkweed, full sun. Upland areas, gray goldenrod. An aromatic aster, as well as purple cone flower. Oh, and I also want to say I'm happy to send these slides out to anyone who would like a copy as well. So, um, you know, if you're moving the slides a little too fast for you to write something down, don't worry. I'll, I'll send these out. I'm just happy if you send me an email. I'll send you the PDF. Short bee balm. Gar garden flocks. This is blooming now. Just started noticing it. It usually starts in July. Dotted bee balm. Notice it's like a, one of our monardas, but it has these stacked flowers. A little bit different than, than many of our other monardas. 
for a shrub, American Beauty Berry. Or f yes, yep, yep, you can. Yeah, don't confuse them with coral berry, which are not edible, but they look similar, and some people get them confused, but yeah. Fragrant sumac, also you can make sumac aid with those berries. Yeah, some people uh, get this confused with poison ivy. The leaves can look similar to poison ivy. Uh, a difference, main difference being that um, on poison ivy, the terminal leaf has a stem or a petiole on it, whereas these are, I believe what's called sessile, where uh, the base of the leaf connects directly to the axle of the two leaves before it. So that's one way to tell apart if you're ever wondering whether what you have. New Jersey tea, uh, this is one that got its name because the American colonialists, when they were Brit uh, protesting British tea, they would, um, were using this instead as a tea substitute. This does not contain caffeine, so I imagine they had a lot of caffeine withdrawal. Uh, we do have some plants that have caffeine, Yapon holly being one of those, but it's not native to the Ozarks, but some people, it will grow here in a landscaped environment, uh, but it does grow in, in uh, Louisiana uh, and south of here. Blue stem goldenrod, fire pink, it's another great one for hummingbirds. It's hard to tell from this photo, but this has a deep uh, tubular kind of uh, flower shape that uh, accommodates their beaks really well. Then woodland phlox, this is one that likes these shadier environments. All right, so briefly I want to cover a few species that are going to be good at improving water quality and that are uh, good for what's called phytoremediation. Uh, some plants have this uh, natural ability, depending on the plant's physiology, uh, depending on how it's adapted to certain environmental conditions. Uh, it can either uh, take up uh, contaminants and break it down through its metabolic processes, or um, it can, uh, its roots will exude certain substances that stimulate microbial activity, uh, and those microbes um, are able to break down uh, certain contaminants, depending on the contaminant in the plant. All plants have the natural ability to facilitate the breakdown of low to moderate uh, levels of petroleum, uh, at levels that you might see in runoff coming from a parking lot, um, but some plants are better at it than others, and it has to do with their root systems. Uh, and how they do this is they exude those sugars and whatnot through the roots that stimulate uh, microbial activity in the soil, and these hydrocarbons become food uh, for certain species of microorganisms. Um, and so when you have certain plants with larger, thicker root systems that don't take up as a greater volume of soil, those aren't able to uh, facilitate as much breakdown. These uh, fibrous, stringy root systems take up a greater volume of soil. They have a greater surface area associated uh, with these root systems, and they're able to do a much better job uh, breaking down uh, petroleum products. So um, keep in mind this would not work in an oil spill kind of situation, anything at a level where it would prevent plants from growing. Uh, this would not be effective. We're really talking about the levels that you might see contained in stormwater runoff. So what are some facultative wetland species that we might uh, include uh, because of its ability to help clean up contaminants contained in stormwater? Well, that eastern gamma grass has been th shown through research to be able to facilitate the breakdown of petroleum, poly polychlorinated biphenyls, as well as pesticides commonly used in residential areas, uh, pendimethalin, uh, chloropyrifos, chlorothalonol. I'm probably butchering those names. Juncus suffusus, soft rush, one that you commonly see and use. This is uh, one reason why uh, Ecological Design Group uses this species in a lot of their low impact development design. But yeah, it is great for breaking down petroleum and it likes growing in these areas where water likes to grow or go. Facultative species, this would include big blue stem. Uh, a lot of these prairie species have those fibrous root systems. <clears throat> uh, research has shown repeatedly that it can break down, facilitate the breakdown of petroleum as well as atrazine, chloropyrifos, uh, pendimethalin, uh, other uh, pesticides I'm not going to try to pronounce because I know I'll butcher that. Switchgrass, petroleum as well as excess nutrients. So uh, maybe you're trying to find a source to uh, suck up some of the extra nitrogen and phosphorus that's coming from your neighbor's property. Uh, it has a fa fast growth rate, produces a lot of biomass in a single year, and that really helps uh, uh, suck up a lot of those nutrients, um, prevent it from getting into the water and causing eutrophication issues downstream. 
We've got some facultative upland species, a little blue stem, also great uh, for breaking down petroleum. Altrazine and pendimethalin with Indian grass. Canadian wild rye, this is one of our native cool season grasses. So the previous two are warm season grasses, so uh, having a combination is good if you would like to have some biomass throughout the year. Bottle brush grass, if anyone has ever had a baby where you had a bottle brush, uh, you can probably tell why it's called bottle brush grass. Those seed heads look very much like bottle brushes. All right, so here's my contact info. Uh, more than welcome to reach out to me. Uh, if you send me an email, I'll be happy to send you a copy of these slides. Uh, also happy to share the research I've collected over the years, uh, the papers and whatnot that I uh, based some of this on. I have a, a folder, uh, just keep it a big trove of it. Um, anyway, uh, so if you wanna write that down, then I'll skip the, uh, to the next slide where I give you some more follow-up information. Good. All right, so if you want to learn more about Wild Ones, Native Plants, Natural Landscapes, there's our website. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram. We're even on TikTok because we're trying to be cool like the young kids. You can join us. You can send us an email, wildonesozarkchapter at gmail.com. Uh, we'd love to see you at one of our monthly programs. Uh, the next one we have coming up next month, we'll be going out to Thaden School in Bentonville and getting a tour of the grounds there. Um, so they do a lot of native plant landscaping. And then after that, I think we got some programs on native bees, how to support uh, your uh, wildlife uh, during the winter time with your yard, that sort of thing. So, and any questions? I have a question. Yes. Same question you just asked a different way. So, the depth of the, of the rain garden would be the three to six inches, and, but that's the active soil, right? So, correct. Like, like, so then the you showed illustrations that have gravel underneath, like, what would be like the maximum depth that we would expect to well, have to dig in our yard? Let me take that back. Uh, the three to six inches is the, the cavity, say, uh, the excavated area that's going to hold standing water. Okay. The depth of the soil can go as low as you need it to. So um, you typically wanted that to go uh, you know, deep enough for the plant roots to be able to establish. And then you're, you're asking about the aggregate level, what level that depth that would need to be at. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's just going to kind of vary um, because there's a lot of information online. That would be the best answer I could give you. Is yeah, there's a lot of information online yes, that you can refer to. Right. So uh, there's uh, great Rains of Garden design manuals written for other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. I think some of those would probably apply here. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I know at, at engineering firms, design firm, landscape architecture, they're probably looking at all these local, you know, calculations, and, you know, drainage areas, all that, when they make those sorts of decisions. Uh, on something like a residential scale, it's probably not that involved. Uh, but yeah, I would imagine like a home ring garden design guide, which are free online, yeah. uh, would be, give you some good information there. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Thank you. All right, thank you. Have a good day. Again, there's two emails that I was able to get online filling them out. Can you just leave them in the box? We'll sort them out. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. Yeah.